All right, Greg Lukianoff, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So you co-authored a book with Jonathan Haidt, a psychologist or professor. Is that what you, what you call him, professor of psychology? A professor of ethics, actually, at a business okay. uh, at um, NYU Stern Business School. Okay, but he, he delves into psychology, and you guys. Oh delve. yeah, no, he's a PhD in psychology. He's right, a, he's a famous psychologist. Right, but you guys came out with a book, "The Coddling of the American Mind: How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure." What was the impetus behind this book? Because this started originally as an Atlantic article. Yeah. And then it got a lot of you know it got passed around a lot. What what was the impetus behind the article? What are you guys describing here? Well, that's that, that's really, frankly, kind of a long story. Uh, but it starts with me working on college campuses as a defender of First Amendment and freedom of speech, going back to shortly after I got out of law school in two thousand one. And for almost my entire career, the most pro free speech constituency on campus were the students themselves. They seem to be more or less telling administrators, even professors, you know, lighten up kind of like uh, that you're not in constant threat, that you should be able to tolerate, you know, jokes that might be racy, et cetera, et cetera. And it was sometime around 2013 and 2014, we noticed a real marked change. And the students were suddenly the ones who were pushing the most forcefully for speech codes and for disinvitations and for trigger warnings and, you know, like uh, new speech codes in the form of sort of like microaggression uh, programs. And that was a real shift. And it seemed to happen almost overnight in 2013. And this led me back to something that I'd been thinking about for years, which I've had issues with depression and anxiety pretty much my whole life. And the thing that really saved me was something called cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's basically like applied stoicism. <laughs> you, you look at the really exaggerated voices in your head that tell you, oh my God, I'm going to die in a situation where it's just a bad date, you know? And you get in the habit of actually answering back with that's irrational, with basically naming these things as cognitive distortions and moving on. And I'd been making the argument for a while that it seems like uh, we were teaching a generation the habits of anxious and depressed people. Good thing the students aren't listening. But then sometime around 2013 and 2014, we started seeing this kind of exaggerated sense of danger, this overgeneralization, labeling, all these things that are called cognitive distortions in cognitive therapy, being mouthed by students as if they were positive, not negative intellectual habits. So that led me to talk to John Haidt, who I already knew because we're, we have a weird position in the culture war, <laughs> given the books we write. He really liked the idea of writing an article about how you could sort of uh, shine a light on what's going on on campuses using CBT as sort of a lens. And it was a very popular article. It was the second most read cover story in the history of the Atlantic at the time. We were, you know, really pleasantly surprised by it and kind of, you know, we're like, oh, oh, that's good. Uh, our job is done. Let's go back to our, our regular day jobs. But all the problems we talked about in that 2015 article just seemed to get worse over the years. And we, after a little while, we decided that we're going to need to write a book about it. Right. So, I mean, I think everyone has heard of, you know, the microaggressions and the trigger warnings. We actually had Bradley Campbell and Jason Manning on the podcast oh, yeah, yeah. a while back ago discussing their theory about this rise of victimhood culture. But I, besides that, I mean, what are some of the examples? I mean, because you guys point out a lot of examples of of these I don't know, cognitive distortions that are going on on campus. Is like, and they're, I mean, it's it's kind of scary, right? Sure. I, was like, man, I mean, you think it's like this is like the onion, like is this really happening? So, what are some <laughs> like, I mean, well, I guess we can talk about the extreme examples because they're funny, but like on maybe some like not so extreme ones, but are still troubling. Well, well one thing I always like to uh, caveat is to say that I see these these things as problems of progress. I wrote a short book called Freedom from Speech back in 2014. And I talk about these kind of problems as problems that get bad partially because other things are getting better, like obesity, you know, like it is a problem caused by having too much, too much access to calories. And I think some of the anxiety that we're seeing is having too much, you know, time to sort of fixate on, in some cases, smaller problems. But also it's made worse by the fact that we can increasingly live in communities that, that are more politically homogeneous than they used to be. We can you know, be on cyber communities that are exclusively people who already 100% agree with us. And all of these things that if you looked at them from the point of, say, like 1974, you'd be like, wow, that actually sounds like a pretty cool future. They have real downsides and they can make people more partisan. They make, can make people more polarized. They can make people more anxious. Gotcha. But yeah, some of the, I mean, some of the things people have probably seen in their Facebook feed showing a protest at college where there's like the heckler's veto where, you know, speak, you know speakers who are invited get booed out and 
looked haunted. I think there's one really bad one where some lady got her hair pulled and you know, she had a concussion. I mean, some really like it's some pretty scary stuff. The, the, the book, you know, definitely I think the mood of the book changes very much depending on what part you're in. We tried right. to open it with sort of like a light opening right. uh, to not make the book feel quite so heavy and to give people a little sense of distance from some of the problems we're talking about. But as you get towards the middle of the book, we cover in some in a, in a great amount of detail uh, some of these really kind of scary cases that have happened on different college campuses. We went into depth, for example, in, at the, in the Milo riots uh, when Milo Yiannopoulos tried to speak at Berkeley. There were you know, riots at, Univers- at UC Berkeley, and I don't really care what people think of think of Milo, but it, watching the videos and getting testimonies from people who are actually there. And by the way, our chief researcher Pamela Paretsky did some real original reporting on this. It was amazing the stuff that she uh, uncovered. It was way worse than I understood from just hearing about it secondhand. And those riots, they were very lucky that, pe- that people didn't get killed. One of the people who was there, I don't, I mean, a lot of people were there not even because they liked Milo. They were just bystanders, were assaulted, including someone, a, a young woman, smashed in the face with a, with a metal flagpole. Her husband right on the top of the head with the same pole, big pool of blood. They're really lucky nobody got killed during these things. And this was in response to something that they just as easily could have had a protest or even, you know, more radically, simply chosen not to attend. Right. Well, let's, I think this is an important point you make that this is something that's happened relatively recently. So it's 2013, you really start seeing students being the ones like, we want control on speech. Right. And I think that's, a, and I thought that was an important point you make because I oftentimes when people see this stuff happening, they always like, oh, it's those millennials, those mm. millennials in their, you know, avocado toast. Uh, they're so, in, but like <laughs> the you, you point that this comes up a lot. Right. Well, you point this is this actually isn't the millennials. This is the generation after them, right? Exactly. And to be fair to you know, particularly to older listeners, this comes in waves. So certainly, when you when you think about the last moments in sort of uh, protest violence on campus and student-led violence on campus. That was the 60s and 70s. And it was much more severe than it is now. I mean, there were literally thousands of bombings across the country, mostly against property, thankfully enough. But, you know, like it was really nuts, some of the protests in the the end of the 60s and early 70s. And then, of course, in the late 80s and early 90s, a lot of the the, the sort of what would be later dubbed sort of like the political correctness movement um, was really strong. But for most of my career, for most of the time, and most of my career has been dealing with uh, millennial students, I think millennials get kind of a bad rap. But when it came to the main complaint that people had about them on campus was more apathy <laughs> as opposed to activism in the name of, of censoring speech. But sometime around 2013, 2014, something, it's almost like a switch was turned and things got a lot worse. And by 2015, while we, while we were happy to see a lot more, and this is after the, the article came out, almost like a, just a couple months after the article came out, we saw nationwide protests on college campuses, which of course, you know, as a First Amendment person, we were like, great, this is great, we're overcoming apathy. But the problem was that some of these protests and some of these protesters were also at the same time using their freedom of speech to demand new speech codes, to demand that professors be fired for their freedom of speech and for um, administrators. And as we talk about in the book in some at some length, uh, administrator who really was trying to send a nice sort of well-meaning email but didn't phrase it perfectly, you know, ends up getting chased out of a job. And so that puts, you know, those uh, the First Amendment people like me in, in somewhat of a funny position because, well, we sure you have a freedom of speech right to oppose freedom of speech. We still think you're wrong. <laughs> you have the right to say that, but we're definitely gonna gonna disagree. And this this really became much more intense around 2013 and 2014, and has kept on uh, kept on going since. And really, if you think about what the what the book is all about, is is trying to get to the bottom of what changed, what uh, what was different about the class that started entering around 2013, 2014. Right. So this is this iGen. So I think Twangy. It's just- sociologist, she uh, you know, wrote that, came with the idea that these are iGeners. These are people who were born when the internet already existed. So they, they have not experienced the world without the internet. So there's that factor. But you- Well, re- really one of the major uh, uh, distinctions, because some millennials pretty much ha- are, are that way too. Right. Um, you know, at least they can't remember a time. But the the big difference that Twangy points to is the fact that they all had the first generation that having a smartphone is really common. And the first generation, which being on social media, started at a very early age. 
And Twenge notes the really dramatic rise in depression and anxiety and suicide, which has just happened in the, in, in the past few years. There's, a, uh, there's graphs in the book that are really dramatic discontinuities of rates of suicide and anxiety and depression and self-reported mental illness right. on, on, on campus. And she notes all of that, which would, you know, one of the reasons why we felt like we really needed to, to write the book was finding all that stuff out. But she uh, puts most of the cause on social media. And our point is essentially, yeah, the, it seems like from the data, you can't really question that social media plays a role, but it doesn't have enough explanatory power. Okay, well, let's go into what you guys, what you all think is behind all this. So you say there's three untruths that have, that this generation, this this generation of young people that it's taken hold of them. The first one is that what doesn't kill me makes me weaker. All right, so that's a playoff of Nietzsche, which he said, sure, yeah, if it doesn't kill me makes me stronger. So what is this idea? How did we go from what doesn't kill me makes me stronger to what doesn't kill me makes me weaker? Um, you know, I see that as largely a problem of progress too. And the way we sort of encapsulate that idea is also by a term that also Pamela Bretsky coined when we were talking about um, trying to figure out what to give this a name that we call safetyism. That essentially sa- safety is all well and good. And definitely, you know, we've made huge strides in childhood safety, for example, by being focused on real physical safety. But safetyism is when you treat it almost like a safe, well, you treat safety itself almost like a sacred value. And where that gets even worse is if when you start watering down what safety means, not just to mean physical safety, but to mean, you know, a a state of being emotionally unperturbed, essentially. Um, And unfortunately, on campuses in the past 10 years, we've seen a lot more acceptance of people using the words safe that I, I feel I don't I feel or don't feel safe to simply mean I feel somewhat uncomfortable. And we point out that this is this is playing, uh, to forgive a pun for, for the name of my organization, which is fire, but this is playing with fire from, because it creates a, a situation where you are sort of conflating a, a real danger with uh, simple uh, emotional discomfort. But that's a kind of predictable outcome if you let the concept creep all the way into, you know, am I in physical danger to am I uncomfortable? Right. So yeah, this concept creep, that was interesting too. Besides safety, moving from just being physically safe to emotionally safe. There's other places concept creep has crept in, right? So the idea of violence, right? Violence used to be like, okay, it's just physical. If someone punches you, that's violence. But now speech, speech is violent. Yeah, the whole, we, we, we've seen, uh, my whole career, there's always been someone trying to say, you know, speech is is, is violence. And that's been a, 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 an argument that people have returned to over and over again. And But the, the thing that's funny to me is not the novelty of the idea that speech is violence, is that the people who, who act like this is a new concept don't seem to get that for most of human history, speech was treated as violence. And, and what I mean by that is most of human history, you'd get your you get beheaded, you get burned at the stake, you'd get you'd be forced to drink hemlock, you'd be crucified for saying things that were that went against sort of public morality, against that were considered blasphemous, which was generally just sort of the norms of the community. Censorship and believing that words are also just another form of violence is the norm in human history. And so when people point out that the distinction between speech and violence is just an invention, I'm like, well, it is an invention, but it's one of the best inventions civilization has cooked up. Because once you accept that, uh, basically, you're, you're essentially allowed to have any opinion you want. And I'm not going to kill you or arrest you for what your what, what your opinion is and, and draw a bright line distinction between speech and violence. You actually create a wonderful opportunity for a pluralistic society that's peaceful and rational and, and figures things out. And the, there have been, you know, even pretty well-educated advocates now in the past couple of years advocating for this, we must understand hurtful or hateful speech is also being a form of violence, who don't get that they're really channeling this ancient, ancient urge to censor those who we don't really like. Yeah, I never thought about that. That's an interesting point. And I think it makes sense because, you know, going back to that whole idea of you know, trigger warnings, microaggressions, you know, those guys talked about how we've gone through sort of three phases of morality. First, it was honor culture. And right, right. And in honor culture, like words are violence, right? If someone says something about you that offends you or hurts your reputation, like, you could, if you wanted, kill them, right? That was acceptable. And then we yeah, moved to exactly. a dignity culture. And, and that yeah, was so, that. 
So cultures of honor, you know, they, they play well in movies, you know, but you don't particularly want to live in, in a time when dueling is kind of expected. And so I'm definitely a lot of, you know, First Amendment people are, are cultures of dignity people, which essentially the idea of culture of dignity, you know, to really boil it down is essentially that we're kind of on our own. It's up for us to we can't resort to violence in dealing with each other. We have to figure out ways to cooperate, collaborate, or choose not to do any of those above. Violence is not the not an option, but generally you try to handle things one on one, and you appeal to power and authority uh, minimally. The difference uh, that uh, we talk about in the book that Bradley and Campbell talk about is when you get to moral dependency, or essentially you're, you see authority's role as an intermediary between you and practically everybody else to resolve all conflicts that come up. And there's a lot of, of things to be really worried about when you um, create a culture of moral dependency, because that's really how you end up with a with a desire for a strong man or a dictator or all these other anti democratic approaches to problem solving. And so, yeah, and also you, you point out in this whole section this idea that that which doesn't kill me makes me weaker. That idea. Actually, I mean, they think they're making themselves safer right. by having safe spaces, by you know, limiting microaggressions, et cetera. But like in the end, you just make yourself more vulnerable right. to those offenses. Yeah, the, 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 it's interesting. A lot of people don't know the self-fulfilling prophecy is actually a, a term that even psychologists use to talk about you know problems you can create by believing you have a problem. <laughs> And that's something that I really want to emphasize is, you know, like sometimes when people say that we're creating all this anxiety and depression that people are, you know, this is just, you know, quote unquote, just in people's heads. Uh, but if you're told your whole life that you, you're not competent, that you need an authority figure to take care of you, that by the way, if you hear something that's really offensive, you're going to be injured forever. And if, and if you experience trauma, you will never really recover from that, which I think is a message we're essentially telling to some students without well, hopefully, hopefully without meaning to. It's incredibly disempowering for one, but it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. You end up having people who believe at their core that, that essentially they are much more fragile than we have any actual reason to believe that they are. But it's only it's sufficient that you believe that. And it's only sufficient that you believe that to actually become someone who is 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 in effect depressed, anxious, and fragile. All right, we'll we'll talk about later on, like what what's going on there? Why kids these days think they're vulnerable and right. fragile? But let's get to the next untruth. The other sure. one is the untruth of always trusting your feelings. Right? How how has that led us astray? That's one of the ones that that sounds the most appealing to the to you know for people who like movies or who have a romantic streak is what's what's wrong with always trusting your feelings? But when you think about it a little bit more, you think about all the sort of either anxious or angry impulses that you have. Some of them, you know, there's a great so social psychologist, Susan David, who, who came up with a great way to think of this. Emotions are information. <laughs> They're not directions. So just immediately doing whatever your feelings tell you is a formula for not a great life and just being sort of dragged by your teeth through life. But it's also a formula for, you know, anxiety and depression as well. So, you know, when we talk about this, this is really where we get most back to these to, to the theories we had in, in the Atlantic article, where we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy and why you shouldn't engage in emotional reasoning. And this is something that that is just a fact, but nonetheless, people find sometimes jarring when you when you practice CBT. Is just remembering sometimes you, when you think you're in danger, you're not. <laughs> Sometimes when you feel like you're, you're you're under threat, you're not. Sometimes when you're when you think someone's out to get you, they're not. And part of the uh, you know great philosophic tradition, one of the great sort of therapeutic traditions, is being able to talk back to these feelings, to interact with them, and question yourselves. You know, is this rational? Does this make any sense? But if you look at some of the ways we argue uh, both now on and off campus, it's all emotional reasoning. It's basically saying the most important thing is that I feel this, and therefore it's true. And meanwhile, you know, it, it sounds cold hearted, but I end up having to say a lot, you know, being offended is an emotional state. It is a statement of an emotional state. It's not an argument of itself. Right. So like, some of these like distortions you talk about, because we've had psychology specialized in CBT on, we've talked about some of the distortions, so, like catastrophizing sure. is one. I mean, how has that manifest itself with these, these college kids on campuses? Well, catastrophizing is one of those ones that I first pinpointed on campus over and over again, coming from administrators before I felt like students were really catching 
latching on to this. But these are, you see these insane arguments sometimes made by campus administrators. I remember one case in which an administrator was trying to argue with a straight face against being allowed to carry protest signs on campus because they could be used as, as like axes and weapons. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, for example, and it's like, in what world are students going around using their signs like battle axes, you know, but cl- clomping off people's heads? This, this is catastrophizing. And sometimes it's done disingenuously to sort of get your way. But we had another case where, where um, it, definitely look, look in the book for this one, but a professor posted a picture of his daughter wearing a T-shirt with a quote from Game of Thrones, which is something like, I will take what is mine with fire and blood. And they suspended the professor because a administrator at that college argued that that was essentially a threat because the fire in the quote on the T-shirt could mean the fire lit of AK-47s. That's actually what, what the administrator referred to, as opposed, you know, as opposed to the fire of the dragons, you know, in in in, uh, in, in Game of Thrones. So catastrophizing is really easy to see that essentially, you know, it's the sky is falling kind of mentality that makes molehills into mountains. Right. And there's also black and white thinking. That's that, 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 that's mine. What I mean by mine, I mean, when I talk about going through cognitive behavioral therapy myself, my wife thinks it's very funny that like, you know, I, I, I I have a tendency to see things as either all or nothing, zero, uh, you know, binary zero or one. And that's something that I really have to, you know, convince myself out of. Like it's either all good or all bad. Not that I actually intellectually believe that, but it's the cognitive distortion that I'm kind of the most prone to either this night's going to be great or it's going to be a failure. Honestly, most nights are somewhere in between. (laughs) Right. Right. And, but like you see this manifest on campus where people are like this person, like uh, if this person comes and speaks like, People are going to die. It's like sure. Well, you know, like well, that's kind of catastrophizing to, in black and white. Yeah. Well, it, and, and that's something that we, when you see people arguing for uh, against commencement speakers, for example, you know, they will sometimes make very legitimate arguments about why they don't like a particular particular speaker. But they, you know, they make it sound like people will lose their humanity if you know, Bill Maher shows up on campus to tell some jokes. And I find this particularly inappropriate when people talk about commencement speakers, because, you know, let, let's take someone who you can understand why people, why people find her controversial. Uh, Condoleezza Rice, the Iraq war, very, you know, very controversial. I understand and defend people's right to protest her. But at the same time, you know, not being able to realize that someone who grew up in, in you know, Jim Crow, Alabama, um, who became the the provost of, of Stanford could have something interesting to say at a, at a commencement speech. I, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what she has to say. But both due to polarization and also due to this kind of binary thinking, it's like either you're good or evil. And if you're in my evil camp, of course, nothing good could come from listening to you. Right. I mean, something, uh, yeah, it's funny, like, you know, understanding how to talk back to your emotions, that's part of becoming resilient, mentally healthy. Like one thing sure. I've done with my son, you know, cause kids like their prefrontal cortex is still developing. So they do a lot right. of emotional thinking. So I always tell yep. my son, like, look, you got a dog brain and you got a human brain, <laughs> like your human brain's still weak. And so whenever you feel upset, like that's your dog brain and you got to tell your human brain to like, Hey, everything's okay. Right. Yeah, learn, learning how to talk back to your own your, your own ideas and your own emotions is, I think, crucial part of maturation and also of mental health. But the reason why I'm such an advocate of CBT, even beyond the realm of therapy, is because if you look at the list of cognitive distortions, they're also just good uh, good uh, rules to live by when it comes to arguing with everyone else. You know, should you be overgeneralizing? Should you be labeling? Should you be catastrophizing? If you want to have a, like a serious discussion about stuff, and the answer is no. And if we actually, if we as a nation decided to look at the list of cognitive distortions and say to ourselves, you know what, I'm probably going to stop myself before I make this overgeneralization, we, I think we'd be living in a much saner society at the moment. The next untruth is uh, the untruth of us versus them. How, do, how is this playing? I mean, I think we all know how this is playing out because we see it in our social media feeds. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the first, in a lot of ways, the art, the book itself is sort of an extension and going much deeper into some of the ideas we talked about in the 2015 article. Uh, but one of the ones that makes it really different is the third great untruth, us versus them. 
because the, the as, one of the aspects we added to it and went very deeply into in the book was how much polarization makes things so much worse. That essentially we have kind of given in to our tribal instincts. And like as I said earlier, since we live increasingly in communities that don't have as much uh, viewpoint diversity, people get much more tribal. And, and it creates a very sort of black and white, good versus evil, once again, also binary thinking approach. And what we've seen happen just in the past uh, year or two is that the you, you've seen this kind of play out on campuses over the years, you know, particularly if you look at, you know, like I said, disinvitation lists or what professors can get in trouble for. But you also have sort of like the sort of alt-right echo chamber. And it was almost like there was a collision between the two just in the past uh, past two years. And it's unsurprisingly, it's pretty ugly. Right. I mean, you talk about the alt-right and, you know, a lot of when people see this stuff on campus, it's usually people who would they would describe as SJW, social justice warriors. But what's interesting, like you kind of talk about in the book, these two groups, the SJWs and the alt-right, they're sort of like the two sides of the same coin, right? Like, you know, the alt-right also takes parts in these like mental distortions where it's all or nothing or everything's everything's terrible. And so these two things collide and it's just like, it's bad. I don't know. It's just craziness happens. Yeah, the most recent trend, and we we have almost a whole chapter about this on the book that's about polarization, but is of more left-leaning professors saying something on Twitter or Facebook or going on Fox News and getting death threats in some cases, getting fired in others. And the most recent case is a professor, Jim Livingston at Rutgers, who what was visiting Harlem, like a lot of New Yorkers, complained about gentrification and complained about some white teenagers he thought were acting like jerks. So he did a little bit of an angry rant. And this is a white guy in Harlem arguing about gentrification in Harlem. And he was found guilty by Rutgers of racial harassment against whites for his privately complaining about gentrification in Harlem. And the we, we, we want people to understand that what's happening now is kind of like this next level where it was bad enough when you could get in trouble for what you said in class when it was just students coming from one side of the spectrum. And certainly we wanted to end that. But now it seems like you're running a gauntlet between these two different extremes. And if the uh, if social justice minded students hear you, you're in trouble. Uh, and if this gets out into the conservative blogosphere, you're in trouble. So what exactly are we allowed to say on campus now? Right. Well, it's not even on campus sometimes, like just something you said privately. Well, right. Yeah. Well, and that's something that in my short book, Freedom from Speech, you know, I, 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 which I wrote back in 2014, I, I was already getting concerned about even though it's not a First Amendment issue, there is something kind of troubling about uh, people getting fired for, you know, something they wrote on on Facebook or some nominally private uh, activity or joke getting getting revealed. And um, uh, we also, I'm an executive producer of a movie called Can We Take a Joke, which is uh, comedians talking about how, the, you know, the call-out culture we see on the internet makes comedy difficult. And there's just uh, countless examples of people, you know, losing jobs or getting in trouble for things that they thought were funny at the time. Well, let me, let's talk about it. Besides making comedy harder, this whole call-out culture that happens on campuses, it makes thinking about really hard issues much more difficult because you have to be careful that you don't do the wrong study or say the wrong, because oh, yeah. that could, but that, that gets in the way of advancements in learning about different ideas. Yeah. As far one of the reasons why we, that the book got a little bit delayed and when we released it is because we kept on getting additional examples of horror stories added and more and more added each day. And the, the chapter on professors really changed um, as we were writing the book, partially because we saw some really horrible stories about the treatment of different professors for publishing articles that were controversial. And that you know, my guess is probably would have been barely controversial maybe five or ten years ago. But, for example, we talk about the case of Rebecca Tuvel, you know, well-respected, well-meaning philosophy professor, and she wrote an article to, um, talking about if we accept the idea of transsexuality, w w what does that mean for someone who is, thinks of themselves as transracial, who actually has an identity that's, uh, like, w what does that mean? Can these two ideas be rectified? And it was, you know, it was a thoughtful article on a provocative topic. And she was treated very much like a heretic. It's a, it's a really, it's a really kind of depressing story because she even relates, or at least we, I don't know if she related it, but we find out that some of the people who signed letters condemning her and demanding that the publication withdraw her article, which I think they actually did, 
w- w- would write her privately and say, "Listen, I didn't. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This is happening to you." And it's like that's that's awful. And right around the same time, there was a a professor who wrote a, and you can understand why this would be controversial, but he wrote a defense of colonialism, partially as a provocative uh, on purpose. So like with with the idea that kind of like, this is a really unpopular argument. Let's do what professors do best. Let's actually make an argument for the indefensible as far as academia is concerned. And they, the professor withdrew the article and the journal, you know, talked about just getting death threats for an academic article published on an academic topic. And um, which uh, one of the things we've been talking about is that retraction has become the new rebuttal. Uh, there's other ways other than death threats and demanding that that article not be published that you can deal with arguments you dislike. But in a situation of moral dependency, the argument is the person in charge has to put an end to this. Right. I mean, you think like that's the whole point of like science, right. of research is you you might have to test controversial ideas and you expect other people to rebut you and right. say why you're wrong and not just shut it down. And then also, you know, I mean, I, I think it's weird too, because like when I went to college, like I went to college expecting I'd have my viewpoints challenged. <laughs> but like it sounds like young people, like they're, that's not their, that's not what they're, that they don't go to college with it. They want to go to college to have their ideas reinforced or kept you know, safe? Well, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of young people who go, who, who would like to have you know, some of their beliefs challenged. But as, you know, Nassim Taleb has even pointed out mathematically, it only takes a relatively vocal minority of students who feel very strongly about it, or a minority of people in any situation, to sort of shift over the people who, you know, don't feel that strongly one way or another over to their side. And, we don't really know if this is a problem of a, you know, a vocal minority, I- illiberal group of people, or if it's more widespread. But we do know that it just, it, it's in, in some cases, to really create a uh, intolerant atmosphere, it just, it take, just takes uh, people not fighting back. Right. So let's talk about how we got here. So what, what we talked about smartphones as one of the things that that access to smartphones, one of the big differences between, say, millennials and this iGen, what else has changed? Like, what else was different about iGen and the way they were raised that would give them, you know, these cognitive distortions, like that life is either black or white, uh, you know, thinking that the worst things could possibly happen to you if you don't prevent them. So what's going on there? Yeah, that's actually, you know, what the real heart of the book is trying to figure out these other explanatory threads, because we definitely think social media plays a role. We think it plays a role in the increase in anxiety and depression for for younger people and for, you know, across uh, the country in general. But we also talk about, as we've already mentioned, polarization, and it it, it is worse um, than it was. It's not just in people's heads that polarization has gotten worse within the past several decades. It shows up very strongly in the data. There were scholars who were looking at the data, you know, and I think they still sometimes interpret this way, uh, who were trying to say there's nothing really to see here because when it came to voting issues, Americans were not quite as polarized as people thought, that, that, that actually there was a surprising amount of agreement on any number of, of voting issues. But really, if you want to check polariz- uh, check out what polarization means, you have to f- look at how intensely they hold those those views and how much they dislike people who disagree with them. That's what polarization really is. It's not about the issues per se. It's about how much you dislike the heretic. And some of the interesting studies show that, you know, whereas once, once upon a time, people would be the most um, hostile to their children dating someone of a different race or religion, now they're the most hostile to the idea of someone dating someone from the other party. This is, you know, Cass Sunstein dubbed this partyism. The polarization really has gotten worse. So that's one thread. Paranoid parenting, we have a whole chapter on that. And, you know, it's kind of like a, like it sounds. And we're mostly talking about the parents of, of the kind of kids who go to, um, uh, to college and particularly elite colleges. But it, the in, intensification of helicopter parenting over the past couple of decades is something that we hear from practically every expert we talk to. Uh, We have a great interview with Julie Lithcott-Hames in the book. Uh, She wrote a book called How to Raise an Adult. And she comes at it from being the dean of freshmen at Stanford and watching this kind of uh, rapid progression from students very rarely showing up with their parents to almost all of them showing up with their, on the first day with their parents. And that the, their parents continuing to have sort of a, di- a daily decision-making power in those students' lives, which is really 
not good if you think about what you're trying to develop for students, which is a sense of independence, a, a sense of locus of control, of, of being able to uh, have autonomy over their own lives, which also goes a long way to explain you know, some of the anxiety and depression and catastrophizing. But essentially, if, you, if you're not used to handling things on your own, everything looks like a catastrophe. One of the most interesting explanatory threads we talk about in it is the decline of free play. We have a whole chapter on the importance of play in which children direct it themselves and with minimal, minimal if, if not, no adult invo- involvement, stuff that all of us kind of took for granted growing up. But it actually turns out that if you deprive kids of unstructured free play time, it can harm uh, everything from their psychological outlook to their creativity and in researching this book and some of the people we talked to, that was the finding that that was uh, that kind of screamed the most at me because I read you know a lot of books about this and Erica Christakis's book, the importance of being little, really hits you over the head with this. And I'm like, wow. So if we know that free time and free play is so essential to developing strong, independent, resilient kids, why the hell are we telling people, telling children, you know, what to do from 6 a.m. to the time they go to bed until they get into Harvard? You know, it seems to be like the research and the practice are completely at odds with each other. And it turns out they pretty much are. Yeah, we've had uh, Lenore Skenazy on the podcast talk about her free-range kid stuff. And she she highlights the same research. Um, Kids are playing this. I think it's kind of weird because, you know, iGen, I imagine these kids are the kids of like Gen X parents primarily. And these are like the latchkey kids in the 70s when like crime was high and they were out like on their BMX bikes, you know, playing with rusty nails. I don't know. Like, but like for some reason, I guess they like, they are like, I don't want my kids to have that childhood. So I'm going to just take care of them extra. Well, I, I tried to, you know, uh, figure this out myself because, you know, I I started working in a restaurant when I was 11. I have all sorts of like childhood neglect kind of horror stories, but some of them are, you know, happy, funny stories as far as I'm concerned. But in researching and trying to be sort of compassionate, understanding where it was coming from, I realized that, you know, those of us who were around before 1993, we were around during a time where it was a pretty safe bet that murder, the murder rate was going to go up almost every year. Things were getting worse, and, they, and it did uh, in terms of murder rate pretty consistently from about the late 1950s to about 1992-93, depending on what city you're in. And so there were reasons for why in the upbringing of these kids uh, that their parents, you know, could actually, having not adjusted their model to a much safer reality we live in now, could be understandably more paranoid. But so there's there, there's some there's some glimmer of sort of of the way you were brought up could actually have some influence on why parents would actually be more paranoid. But the things that really kick this stuff into high gear is you know, social pressure. That once it becomes kind of a value, once you have safety as some sort of in place, you're suddenly the bad mom or dad if you don't act like you're completely obsessed with safety and it kind of spirals out of control. But the scariest stuff of all is the fact that, you know, people sometimes get arrested for letting their kids play in the, uh, in, in the playground while they're at work, for example, for letting their kids walk home. Lenore uh, actually also appears quite a bit in the book. We did some great interviews with her and she, she's a friend of ours as well. And the, if you've reached the stage where people are actually getting arrested for, doing stuff that we took for granted any kid should be allowed to do when we were kids. Um, you, you have to start there and then make sure people aren't getting arrested for it, but then also empower students, uh, empower parents to realize there are other parents who think like you and, you know, form a free range kids association and make sure your kids can go out and play. So let's recap. So this, this lack of unstructured play, the helicopter parenting, I mean, it sounds like what that does is it doesn't allow kids to develop that human brain, their prefrontal cortex, right? So they don't, they don't have to make choices that manage where they have to manage risk on their own. They basically rely on their parents for that. And that well, that's, stunts them. And that's where we bring in the whole locus of control idea that essentially the research is pretty strong on this and it makes perfect sense that if you feel like you have no control over your own life. That's a formula for anxiety and depression. And it even turns out that giving, you know, people in, in elderly homes and in, in facilities, even giving relatively small choices over you know, regarding their daily lives and, you know, the art that's in the room and that kind of stuff really improves people's sense of happiness and well-being. So obviously, if you make, you know, a 22-year-old feel like they can't have much control over their own life or for that matter, even a 14-year-old, you're really undermining their ability to feel like they're competent 
as a person. Right. I think uh, it was interesting. So I think, uh, you know, iGen, one issue that's been really big for them are the school shootings. Right. Yes, um, safety, absolutely. Which it makes sense. Like school shootings are terrible. But I remember after the one in, was it Parkland? Yep. Like there was a kid in high school, you know, he's probably 16. And he was like, we're children. Like we shouldn't have to deal with that. And I, I remember like heard that. And I was like, man, when I was 16, I never would have been like, I'm a kid. Take care of me. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm 16. I can drive. I got a job. Like I never would have thought of myself as a kid. I think it's, I mean, it's a kind of an interesting shift in mindset maybe between generations it is a fl- it is a flipping mindset and i have seen a lot more of students kind of thinking themselves in a, in a younger way than we would have when we were 15 or 16 but it also does come to the fact that you know when people ask you know more or less is all of this sort of uh, political outrage all in their heads it's like well actually you know of course when i was a kid <laughs> we weren't seeing you know, semi-regular videos of unarmed, you know, black people being shot by police, you know, or, or, or choked or, or whatever. So uh, partially due to social media, we're a lot more aware of some of the stuff that's out there. Right. And school shootings, you know, are terrifying. The, as far as just even no matter how much you tell people about stats, you know, since I grew up in uh, near Newtown, Connecticut, it doesn't change the fact that you still as a, and I'm a, I'm a recent parent myself, that you're like, wow, the school someone came and attacked little kids, you know, with, with, with guns yeah. um, is something that really can kind of mess with your head. So we do try to do as much as we can to nod at, yeah, yeah. We're not just saying <laughs> that everything's peachy and people should just get over it. But what we are saying is no one is helped by some of these intellectually uh, unhealthy habits that we, we, we've developed. If you really want to address some of these problems, you're not going to be able to do it if you're in a, in a constant state of panic. So what can, what can we do to mitigate this? I mean, it was like, what can colleges do? Do they, because this is hard for colleges because there's a lot of, uh, there's PR they have to handle oh, sure, yeah, there's yeah. lawsuits. So yeah. like, what can they do about this? That, and that's one of the factors that we have in there. there there's completely non-ideological factors, like whether or not they're fear of lawsuits or federal, federal regulations. I am proud of the fact that we do have a, a section at the end when we talk about solutions. But one thing I really want to stress of that in the solution section is we want people to read the book and they want them to come them to come to us with more solutions because we think that there are ways, surprisingly, deceptively e- easy ways we can help at least ameliorate some of these problems, you know. But when it comes to campuses, you know, there's a lot of throwing up people's hands about, oh, you know, we've got this intolerant of, of students on campus and we've got this completely unpleasable contingent off campus and it's all just, um, it's all just rotten. And, you know, the, the instructions for university presidents might, uh, are they're easy to say, they might be hard to follow is, you know, don't fire a professor in the face of an outrage mob. Get used to doing that. Um, because the first time you, you, you break that rule, the next group that comes to you is going to be like, but you, you fired this guy. Why, 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 won't, why won't you fire the next one? So really planting your feet firmly on that. Adopt something like the Chicago Statement on Academic Freedom, you know, is a good way to start, which you, you can find out more about uh, in the book. And when people really lament about like the lack of respect for free speech and academic freedom on campus, I'm like, so why don't we teach people about that? <laughs> because if you look at the orientations at, at universities, we, we could find only one or maybe maybe two schools that had that spent some serious time talking about freedom of speech, academic freedom, free inquiry, all of these but were frankly, although we may take them for granted, are actually pretty sophisticated and in some ways counterintuitive uh, concepts that someone needs to directly explain to you. And if they don't actually get them, you can't complain if you've never actually explained it to them. So, like the easiest, you know, start way to, way to start is actually start teaching some of this stuff. Right, and I imagine it also, you know, professors have to kind of band together instead of doing the whole call out thing. Or if they see a professor getting called out, like don't just be silent, try to defend them. Oh yeah. Now, now as far as something that has just been a huge disappointment for me working on campus is, uh, you know, in some cases we're talking about tenured professors here. And, you know, one of their colleagues might get in trouble for something that they, you know, uh, said in class or said outside of class or a student, for that matter, might get in trouble. And it's really rare that a tenured professor comes forward and say, enough is enough. No way. Um, my student should not be expelled for that. And you, and you barely, uh, there's barely a more secure job that exists in the country than, than a tenured professor. And it's that's why it's so disappointing that it can be so rare for tenured professors to take a stand in the name of free speech and academic freedom, um, which is ironic, of course, because the justification for tenure was to defend academic freedom. 
Now, there, there are notable exceptions. Of course, Alan Kors at Penn, who was one of the founders of FIRE, you know, was always standing up for both the rights of professors, but also, importantly, the rights of students as well. And I think that uh, groups like Heterodox Academy that John, John Hyde helped start, my, my co-author, um, play an important role. FIRE has been engaging with professors more often. We actually have a, a, a annual conference with professors. And yeah, having each other's back a little better can make a big difference. What about, what can parents do? To oh yeah, do um, what could, there's an awful lot that parents can do. And teach about dog is, brain and human brain. What's that? <laughs> teach about dog brain and human brain. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so in terms of what parents can do is, is to me the the the, the finding, uh, the repeated findings that free time and free play are really healthy for the development of kids should be greeted as not just good news, but a good message for the lives and happiness of parents themselves, you know, that essentially in some ways, as we find time and time again, um, in some cases, doing less is actually doing better, not scheduling every, any minute of your kid's day, making them achieving a sense of independence is important. There's a great book called Actung Baby, which is about how Germans raise their kids. And despite our German our stereotypes of, of Germany as a very authoritarian country, partially because of, actually largely because of its authoritarian past, the ethos uh, in German parenting, at least as described in this book, is that you really want to have independent, resilient kids, um, you know, who uh, are able to kind of take care of themselves because they see that as a sort of a penance for their Nazi past, but also a bulwark against authoritarianism in the future. And I think they have it exactly right. This is the, this is a good way to defend your students' sense of resilience. And it's also, not, not coincidentally, a way to, re- res- uh, to, to help defend a free society. <laughs> but probably the, the recommendation that we came to um, just very naturally by the end of it was a cultural expectation of a gap year. And we don't want this to be mandated or anything like that. But I do think that nothing can quite help help students feel like they have that locus of control, like they have that independence, like they have that judgment, like having a year when you're not actually in school, where you're working a job, maybe in some other part of the country, maybe in some other part of the world, but working a real job for, for, for a little bit or having some kind of uh, real life experience before you actually go into college. I think... <clears throat> That could help a lot. Well, as I was reading this, I was thinking, like, what do you do, like, when you encounter one of these? You know, like again, like I think the important point to make: these people often like they're in the minority, right? Mm-hmm. Be- but because of social media, it can just seem like everyone is like this, everyone's crazy. But right, what do you sure. do when you encounter like a zealous ideologue online, or maybe in your own family? Maybe you got a cousin or a nephew that you know they kind of taking part in this uh, distorted thinking. Should you even engage? Do you engage with them? Do you, like, do you CBT on them? Like, <laughs> I think it's like, like, what do we do now with these people? Like, when, with this conversation that's going on, that just seems crazy. Honestly, it's always a. It, it always depends. The it depends on how. <laughs> How far gone someone is if they're actually willing to talk to you at all. But you know, becoming a good listener, as as lame as that may seem, is pretty is a pretty good place to start. And uh, you know, I have a peculiar position in the culture war between sides that really hate each other, and I, I've gotten used to being able to. Uh, Sometimes just turn off my opinions and try to come, try to figure out where people are really coming from. And what's funny is when you look at sort of, you know, people who might be more progressive on campus, they get why they should do that if they're in like a foreign country. But both my parents, my dad grew up in Yugoslavia, and I used to kind of piss off people at Stanford by explaining it this way. Listen, I, I know if I was explaining like the culture that Serbs or Croatians have about different things, you would try to be understanding and figure out where they were coming from. Why can't you try to do that for people from Kansas? <laughs> Why can't you try to do that for, you know, our Americans who come from backgrounds that are different than yours? And so I think that we do, that some of the people who are the most zealous and the, and the most sort of morally absolutist do have some intellectual habits that, that value things like empathy, just getting them to actually try to, to show that for the Republican they disagree with, and, uh, honestly, and not just uh, dismiss them as, uh, as a uh, stereotypical monster. Well, Greg, where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Well, we have a website called thecoddling.com. Um, we actually intentionally named the it coddling. that way to <laughs> sound like a horror movie, um, right. partially to kind of make a little bit of light of it. I think people get really hung up on the title and it's an opportunity for us to say, you know, the coddling is coming for your children, like the blob is coming. But really, what, what we're saying is something much more nuanced. Than that. Well, Greg, thanks so much for coming on. It's been a great conversation. 
My guest today was Greg Lukianoff. He's the co-author of the book, The Coddling of the American Mind. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find more information about the book at thecoddling.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash coddling, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.